This week on Inside the Issues, we speak with Rianne Mahon on social policy. Welcome to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week we talk to a distinguished scholar or practitioner working in the forefront of some issue of global governance. And this week I'm very ha happy to have here with me in the studio my colleague Rianne Mahon, who's the uh, CG Chair in Comparative Social Policy at the Balsley School of International Affairs and at Wilfrid Laurier University. Welcome, Rianne. Thank you, David. So social policy is not something a, a lot of people assume immediately is a topic of global governance. And I do want to talk about that, but before we get that far, let's talk a bit about uh, comparative social policy. What is it? Why do we do it? What can we learn from it? Okay, well, first of all, I guess the, uh, you might want to say, why do you want to study social policy? I guess many people would sort of think social policy, that's just, you know, sort of social assistance for poor people. It doesn't have much to do with my life. And in fact, that's wrong, especially when you focus on the, the aspect of, of social policy I'm most interested in, which is, has to do with care. Um, in fact, there's a lot of discussion, and not just in Canada, of what you might call a care crisis, which is linked to changes in labor markets, changes in families, uh, uh, women's increasing labor force participation, demographic change, which is falling fertility rates and uh, aging. And what, what this means is, is that you have a situation where once upon a time you could rely on mothers, daughters, sisters, wives to provide care for very young children or the frail elderly or people who are at home sick. Uh, and you can't do that any longer. And so that many countries then are facing a question of, well, how do you provide that care, which is no longer, you can't assume it's going to be provided in the family. Right, and the main site of social policy is sovereign states, individual Sovereign countries are responsible for their own social policies. And there's relatively little, as I understand it, in the way of international coordination or, or global harmonization. Pretty much states can do more or less what they want. They can, although there's a lot of things happening. For example, within the European Union, which began as primarily just uh, an economic union, uh, they realized quite quickly, in fact, you had to do some kind of social policy harmonization or people might all go from one place to the other, especially right. once labor markets begin to open up. Uh, so that there's been a lot of development around social policy issues, especially in the area I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, actually, around the reconciliation of work and family life. Right. Uh, and so the European Union has adopted guidelines and, and uh, agreements around sort of that all the member countries would have to have um, uh, child care for children three to six um, you know, for a certain percentage by uh, 2010 or 2015, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's not just within the European Union. Certainly, the North American Free Trade Agreement doesn't have much in the way of social policy, but Canada's a member of the OECD, right. uh, which has, in fact has a whole sort of several units which focus very much on social policy issues that are of common concern, tries to flesh out sort of what are different countries are doing and, and to establish some sort of sense of what best practice might be. Right. The, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. Right, I'm sorry. No, that's right. Uh, and Canada's a bit unusual in the sense that our social policy is to some extent a federal responsibility and to some extent a provincial responsibility. So I suppose you could do comparative social policy within a Canadian context, couldn't you? Absolutely. And, and in fact, I mean, most Canadians would sort of think about it in terms of comparing different provinces, which of course is quite interesting. And in the area that I know best, which has to do with children, especially early childhood education and care, of course, Quebec stands out. Uh, as having a very kind of Western European style uh, policy of $7 a day child care with an attempt to provide good quality child care for all children over a, a certain age. Um, that's in marked contrast to the province where I come from, Saskatchewan, which is actually the worst of, of all 10 provinces. Well, right. To my surprise, mm, yes. Yeah. Surprise to me They got well. to do the research on that. That's very interesting. But you actually want to go down another level. Uh, I did some work for the Canadian Policy Research Networks, which used to exist uh, when it was doing some very important research around child and family policy. And uh, that focused on uh, uh, different cities across Canada. Mm. And Toronto is actually one of the leaders. It, way back in the 1980s, established kind of the guidelines for um, um, the kind of policy that Quebec has. Mm. And it's done as much as you possibly can with the resources that a city has under our kind of system. I imagine that uh, Toronto's social policy budget is probably bigger than at least one province's yes. social policy yes. budget. Yeah. And how did you get involved in 
this? Uh, what drew you to the topic of comparative social policy in particular? Well, it was actually, I was doing comparative policy, but in another area. I'd spent about 10 years working on uh, the transformation of work and of labor markets in, and with a particular focus on, on Canada and Sweden. I was just coming to the end of that research when I got a phone call from a friend saying, listen, I've got this project with uh, a number of colleagues looking at childcare policy in, in a number of European countries, and the person who's doing Sweden knows a lot about childcare, which I didn't know much about at the time, but she doesn't speak Swedish uh, or read Swedish, and um, I wondered if you'd work with her. So that kind of drew me in, and I realized that there was an enormous amount of, of uh, uh, opportunity in, in this area and interest. Certainly there is. Well, we'll be back in just a minute with Rian Mahon, and we'll uh, continue our discussion about comparative social policy. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at uh, cgonline.org, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Welcome back. Uh, Rian, let's talk a bit about some of the comparisons you've actually done, the countries you've studied. Uh, so you've already mentioned that you've studied Sweden. So Canada and Sweden is one pair of countries you've compared and contrasted. Uh, what are the interesting differences? What are the interesting similarities? Well, at one level you might say it's black and white. Really? Uh, when it comes to things like childcare, Canada is one of the worst of the OECD countries. Uh, in fact, uh, a branch of the um, uh, UNICEF that focuses on the more developed countries called Innocenti, which is based in Italy, did a study and we ranked below Mexico. Really? Yes. Uh, so Canada is very bad, and, and in fact, Sweden's at the other end of it. Uh, it has a really sort of, uh, and lo has had for quite a long time, a well-developed system of, of early childhood education and care beginning from age 18 months. And that's ranked according to what measure? Oh, uh, well, the Innocenti study did a number of things, uh, including sort of inoculations and so on, but I'm, I'm focusing particularly in terms of provision of, of uh, child care. And Canada has at best a patchwork of purpose, as we said earlier. Quebec is doing quite well. If you look at the city of Toronto, it's, it's actually doing, it's got the, the largest number of child care spaces outside of the province of Quebec. Is that right? Um, but then you look across the country and, and uh, despite uh, a lot of discussion over the last uh, 20 years, in fact, it's, it's, it's a very thin and raggedy patchwork. So Sweden provides a lot more spaces for children. Exactly. And is there a, an outcome difference as well? Do, do you study outcomes? Well, if I guess you sort of one outcome uh, measurement might be the PISA studies, and, and in some ways Canada does quite well on those. But, but Sweden's way up there. And Finland, which is another Nordic country that again has a quite a, a well-developed system of early childhood edu education and care, is usually number one in the PISA studies. So we have quality but not quantity, right. more or less. Yes. Oh, that's, uh, so. Is that a function of the fact that Canadians just don't care as much as Swedes do about this? Or uh, is Sweden more proactive at a governmental level in attempting to, to build and maintain a robust early childhood education system? In other words, is it a demand issue or a supply issue that explains this contrast? Uh, there have been moments in, in Canada's history when we've come so close. Uh, in, in the 1980s, uh, when the Liberals had been in office for quite a while, there was the Abella Commission, which made a very strong recommendation for child care. And then there was the, uh, uh, they set up a task force headed by Katie Cook, uh, which reported to a different government that had a different agenda and uh, <clears throat> that put forward a child care bill, which was uh, quite soundly rejected by uh, child care advocates, uh, parents and, and child care providers right across the country. And so the Tories let it die in, in, in the House and um, we didn't get a bill. And then the Liberals came into power in the early 1990s with a promise of doing something around child care. Um, and the, along came the deficit crisis. Um, Axworthy lost the battle to, to try and fund this and once again it went under. Then so it was the, mostly a funding constraint. Well, yes, and a political or, or sort of shifts in, in, in political pressures because again, under the Liberals, uh, there was increasing uh, emphasis on sort of funding this and trying to get things going across the country. The, the Martin government had actually come to an agreement with all 10 provinces to fund an early childhood education and care system, which was differentiated across the provincial lines, and then we had an election. Right. But Sweden's had, uh, they have a history of social democratic governments. That's correct, yes. And in Canada we don't. Yes. Uh, except in some provinces we have. Now in the provinces that have had um, new democratic party governments, did they perform markedly better? 
Uh, Manitoba is one of the better provinces uh, outside of Quebec. First of all, I guess you could say that the Parti Québécois is, is a kind of something of a social democratic party. Um, Manitoba has indeed forged, uh, forged ahead both under the original NDP government and then later BC has had a pretty reasonable record, but Saskatchewan is really an outlier and it proves that it's not just social democracy, but other kinds of demand factors, if you like. Right. Now, you've also done work on Mexico and Argentina. That's just starting. Just starting. What have you found so far? Well, what we're, again, uh, if you look at the comparative studies, you would expect Canada to do better than Argentina and, and Mexico, but in fact, that is not the case, especially with regard to preschool for children from three to school start. Uh, both those countries have very close to uni universal coverage, uh, and we have a very abysmal coverage. So that's one of the interesting contrasts. Right. It's kind of counterintuitive. And you uh, wouldn't expect it because Canada's a wealthy country. Exactly. And these are, you know, they're, they're middle income, but they're certainly within the developing world. But the other reason why I'm really interested in looking at them with a, a number of colleagues who are fluent in Spanish, which I'm just learning now, uh, is that all three countries are federal countries. And despite the fact you can sort of, as, as you say, you can sort of say something at the level of Canada, Mexico, and Argentina, when you dig deeper uh, to the sort of provincial equivalent scale or even down to the municipal scale, you find in all three countries quite important differences. And do Mexico and Argentina do better than Canada because it's more centralized? This is more of a federal competence? Yes. In fact, it, it has, they have moved to greater decentralization in the area of education, but, but initially they were much more centralized, and there still is a, a kind of a tradition of, of, a, of national leadership. And how is it that they can afford nearly universal access? I guess you put your money where you think it matters. And, uh, Not they, that it's just um, much cheaper. Labor costs are so much cheaper that you can hire the people at a much lower rate. No, well, it. in terms of childcare, which is different from preschool, right. uh, in fact, yes, a lot of that in both those countries, it, for those people like myself or professional women, it would be p provided by hiring somebody uh, to come and work in your house rather than having a good quality uh, childcare, which is what I would prefer to have. And what are they not spending money on that enables them to do this? Is it sort of the, and in Canada, healthcare is an enormous expense item. Uh, education is an enormous expense item, transfers to individuals. I assume those are probably health care I, I know a bit more about Argentina in this case, and certainly the, uh, the health care system in, in Argentina is in, in um, quite a bit of a shambles and uh, really needs sort of significant investment. Mm -hmm. and now you've also done some work on Korea. Yes, um, uh, although uh, I've decided finally to kind of let my friend Ito Peng, who's at the University of Toronto, is, is really taking the lead on that one. But Korea is really interesting because it entered into a major financial crisis in, in late 1990s, as you probably know. And uh, instead of going backward in terms of social investment, it, has, it began to move forward in a whole range of areas, one of which was early childhood education and care, but also unemployment insurance, uh, social assistance for the poor, uh, developing a much better health healthcare system. So that's why I was really interested in Korea. And I'm still, you know, when I'm teaching, I, I, I bring in the Korean case as, right. as an important one. Oh, fascinating. Well, we'll be back again in a moment with Rianne Mahon on uh, uh, early childhood education and social policy more generally. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at uh, cgonline.org on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Welcome back, Rianne. Uh, let's go global now and talk about social policy from a global governance perspective. Uh, we've already talked about how social policy is usually the, the uh, responsibility of uh, countries, their central governments, or provinces, or in some cases, cities. Is there a demand anywhere for a kind of global approach to social policy, or is that just off the table because of the way the world is organized into sovereign states? Well, in fact, it's been on the table for a long time. Uh, if you go back to the League of Nations and the International Labor Organization, it's actually played quite an important role in disseminating um, pol social policy models. Uh, uh, for example, the uh, whole, if you look at a lot of the Latin American um, social policies, they're really based on a kind of a system which was first developed in Germany. And the ILO was a very major disseminator of that. They would, they would go in, they would provide sort of technical advice and so on. Uh, so it goes way back uh, into that period. And, and the ILO still is quite important on a number of issues, but other players have, have come into it. I mentioned earlier the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, which plays quite an important role. And, and I can give you a couple of examples, in, again, in the area that I'm interested in. 
Uh, they did a major study called Babies and Bosses, which Canada participated in. It was for, involved 14 countries and looked at policies to help reconcile work and family life. And uh, then came up with a sort of a, a, a broader kind of a set of recommendations out of that in terms of what best practices are. Each country got criticized, even, even, even the winner, Sweden, but uh, certainly Canada, uh, some, some key areas of problematic areas were pointed out. And then the other one was, which was really interesting, was called Starting Strong, which was a, a sort of a major kind of in-depth study of a number of, of uh, OECD member countries around the provision of early childhood education and care. And Canada participated in round two of that. Uh, so it, it, and these studies even, you know, sort of the OECD can't tell us what to do, but the, these studies are certainly paid attention to by uh, people within government uh, at, at different scales in right. Canada and by, by activists as well. Right. There's sort of a naming and shaming of That's uh, right. value to it, isn't there? And then in addition, there's uh, the World Bank has become a sort of a major player uh, around sort of uh, promoting the idea of investing in early child development. And what's really interesting is its conception of what should be done is, is markedly different from uh, what the OECD argues for, because the OECD argues for a much more universal system. It's much more inspired by what, it, uh, what it's found in, in, in Western Europe. And uh, the World Bank instead kind of draws on the, what, what we do call the American social policy model, which is very much, we help the poor, um, but the rest, the middle class can take care of itself. And um, that model is very problematic because when you have policies that are only targeted at the poor, this is one finding that you do get from comparative social policy, they're not very good policies. Oh, interesting. It's like health care. In Canada, we have a health care system that involves everybody, and then we care about it, and we want to make sure it's a good one. But if it's only for them, we're not very generous. And that's, uh, again, uh, one finding that they found sort of in the universal systems like Sweden's uh, do much better in terms of generosity because they involve everybody. And systems like the U.S., which target the poor, in fact, tend to be offer rather poor quality right. services. Now, you've mentioned the OECD a couple of times, and that's really a club of very wealthy countries. So is it fair to say that when people talk about global standards of social policy, they're really talking about standards for wealthy countries? Is there any hope or expectation or desire, for example, that very poor countries would adopt certain best practices when it comes to either early childhood education or labor policy? Well, actually, the OECD helped to develop the Millennium Development Goals. So the OECD doesn't just talk sort of to its own member countries. It also kind of has a kind of a broader orientation. Its membership also, by the way, now includes countries like Mexico and Chile uh, and Latin America. But there are other organizations like the uh, UNESCO, which is also based in Paris. And, and I, I would say on these kinds of issues, it's much more closely aligned with the OECD than with the World Bank. Um, is in charge of the, pro, of the agreement we all came, came to called Education for All, which has an early childhood component, and, and it really is promoting these kinds of developments in poor countries like Kenya or Bangladesh and so on. What's the one area of social policy that you think we're doing best in when it comes to globalizing standards? We in Canada or? In the world. Mm, that's a tough, tough issue. Maybe, maybe around education. Education. And that's an easier sell these days because you can sort of say it's also economically relevant because you're educating the future workforce. And if you want to have sort of countries that are going to be able to be economically competitive, you have to have an educated populace. Right. If you want to deal with inequalities in, in these countries, you can then sort of deal with it intergenerationally by investing in young children today so that they won't have the poverty of their parents tomorrow. Mm. What are we doing worst in, do you think? What's the biggest gap? Well, the other one I was going to say, I, I, how I was going to handle it, was there's a nice uh, notion picked up by a, a, one of the Canada research chairs at U of T, Tanya Lee, called the will to improve. And I think that's one of the wonderful things is that we have a will to improve the world and make it better, but a lot of bad things can also be done under the, the rubric of the will to improve, and so that's the best and the worst. Now, we often think of social policy as a, a critical marker of culture. So in a very heterogeneous world with many different cultures and different ideas, for example, of even what education mm -hmm. consists in. How do you go about trying to globalize standards? Well, Is I'm it effectively Western imperialism, or, or do you try to find some least common denominator that's inoffensive to all cultural practices? How do you actually go about Well, I was going to, I, I was going to answer you in a different way. The, uh, I was in a study one time with, with a number of, of Swedes and Canadians, and um, the Swedes came to me and, and they said, 
Rianne, I don't understand. What, what is this state that the Canadians keep talking about? So I explained, they said, ah, oh, you mean society. And so the, the, Swede, the Swedes don't view government as, as a part and, and kind of a... Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so that was a very interesting kind of insight into the difference in culture as between Sweden and Canada. But I also wouldn't want to take culture in a static sense. So this, how that conception of, of government as society is developed is also something which is very active. And, and so I've studied actually the history of, of the, the struggle over things like childcare in Sweden. And it wasn't born overnight. It didn't just become came come about because they were social democratic. It came about because people fought real battles and sort of shaped that culture. And I think there's a lot, for example, in Canadian culture around social liberalism that offers the possibility for some very good outcomes in social policy terms. Right. And now for, for almost 60, 65 years now, we've had a world in which the United States has been the single most powerful country. And we don't normally think of it as a leader in this direction. It's not generally thought of as a terribly progressive country in social policy. That's right. Is that, has that been a major problem or not? Well, I think it is when, when major organizations that have a certain amount of clout with, with regard to the third world, uh, like the World Bank, um, look primarily to American researchers and to American experiences in terms of developing social policy models, which they are doing around early childhood development, and they aren't looking to other ones. Right. But on the other hand, I imagine that American civil society is actually quite active and probably very creative in promoting social policy innovation. Yeah, that's true. We'll be back uh, once again with Rianne Mahon in just a moment. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at uh, cgonline.org, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Welcome back once again, uh, Rianne. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit more about the, the gender dimension of social policy, and that's one of the dimensions on which cultures are so different. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Canada, in the United States, Western, Northern Europe, we fancy ourselves relatively gender blind and we fancy ourselves uh, uh, fairly e egalitarian as between right. men and women. That's not true everywhere in the world. Uh, how does the gender dimension play into the, the difficulty of crafting best practices and global standards for social policy? I mean, that, that is a really good question, but, but I think actually when we go back to what we've achieved and what we haven't achieved, I think things like the movement beginning uh, with the, uh, uh, you know, sort of the international decade of women back in the 1970s and moving forward to Beijing and so on has been really important in raising issues of women's rights. Uh, you know, they don't need to be pursued in exactly the same way in, in all places. But uh, I know, for example, one of my PhD students, former PhD students, did a from Argentina did a really wonderful thesis sort of showing how those debates have really opened up possibilities within in, uh, what was a very conservative, Catholic, familialist regime. And they still haven't won the right to, to abortion, but they've really opened up to sort of at least some reproductive rights, uh, access to contraception and so on, which is really important to, um, to women's health and, and to their ability to live equally with men. All right. But at the same time, Beijing was, was famous or notorious to the extent that there were obvious clashes between European, North American, Asian women's exactly. groups on their understanding of what the, the key problems were and the best approaches to solving them. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a pervasive problem? We will always encounter these cultural differences on the issue of gender and social policy, or do you see some sort of larger scale convergence taking place? Well, I think you'll always have differences, and I think the most important thing is, is to have a, a context in which we can have dialogue and negotiation. That we don't just, you know, sort of, I have a particular experience coming from Canada and, and so on, but I have to realize that, that there are other ways of seeing things, and, and that kind of dialogue, I think, enriches both sides, and we can kind of move towards something which is actually better for all without it being sort of like putting it in a blender and making it look all the same. Right. And what about Canada? We like to think that we do really well on social policy, and you've told us <laughs> that we don't. Um, in some ways, we've performed quite badly. Uh, can we, at this point, play a leadership role in global debates about best practices on social policy, or have we, have we lost our bona fides? I would certainly say Canada wouldn't be regarded as a leader now. Uh, it certainly has lost a lot of credibility, and it really is an embarrassment if you look at, at I mean, certain, the, the OECD study I referred to earlier on, Starting Strong, handled it with delicacy, but if, if you look at it quite carefully, Canada really comes off very poorly. 
uh, the Innocenti study was even sort of uh, tougher in, in terms of, of naming us in this particular area. Um, so I, we certainly haven't been a leader, but that doesn't mean we have been done more things in the past. And I think if we kind of work a bit on getting our own house in order while also thinking internationally that we'll do a bit better. And if we were to try to take a leadership role internationally, what, what issue area would you target? Where would Canada have the biggest impact? Well, uh, well certainly we've, we've done some good things. Uh, we do well in education, beyond, except with the exception of early childhood education. Uh, we, we're usually one amongst the top countries in terms of the PISA studies. And those don't just measure narrow success, they also measure how well do you do at overcoming uh, intergenerational differences in human capital, to put it in that awful terminology. Uh, so that there, there's something where Canada isn't pretty good at. And uh, that's, I guess going back to education is one of the areas where we, uh, there has been a lot of investment in and there's a lot of scope for doing that. How about our multiculturalism, which we, we also take great pride in? We like to think that we do that better than anybody else. Is we're, that we're not perfect, but that really is very, very important. Right. And being in this kind of society, I was, I was speaking with a, Jap a Japanese colleague of mine who actually did his PhD at U of T, theory is behind me, and, and he's back in Japan now, and he said, I really miss Canada for the diversity and for the, the ways in which all those people with different kinds of cultures and different faces can kind of live in a pretty peaceable kind of way together. Mm -hmm. It, which makes uh, something like the City of Toronto fairly amazing, not just as a challenge. The City of Toronto is a very good example, But actually. really is a success, I suppose, because mm -hmm. it's a city with fairly, fairly good social policy, a yep. fairly good network, and a fairly good safety net. Yeah, and actually, it, it was, yes, an excellent social policy. Um, I did a, a study with a, a colleague of mine uh, which compared, sort of set both Toronto and Mexico City within their larger context, and in both cases, Mexico City and, and Toronto were well ahead of the rest of the country in terms of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So we really do learn quite a lot from very focused comparisons, don't we? Yeah. And we can draw good generalizations from looking at particular cases. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your expertise with us today. Thank uh, you. I've been joined uh, this week by Rianne Mahon, the CG Chair of Comparative Social Policy at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Please join us again next week. I'm David Welch, uh, your host, and look for us at cgonline.org, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter.